Let's say together. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. We are on a four-part sermon series called Overcomers in Christ. You heard part one last week. The topic was, we are more than conquerors. Today, the topic given to me in part two was dealing with negative emotions. And it's based on Philippians 4, verses 6 to 8. Let me read it for you. Beginning from verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think. Think about such things. This is the Word of God. You know, I was given this topic, dealing with negative emotions. And as I was preparing for this topic, I was filled with negative emotions. I was asking myself, what makes you think you're an expert on this topic? What do people expect to hear from you? And do they expect a solution to the negative emotions in just one sermon? Okay, let me manage your expectations for the sermon. Negative emotions can't be solved in one sermon. The solution. The solution is not teaching you techniques to motivate yourself. The solution is not to learn techniques about thought control or mind management. So what's the solution? The solution to your emotions is communion with one person. I need you to say this with me. There's a rhythm to this. Let's say it together. The solution to your emotions is communion with one person. One more time. The solution to your emotions is communion with one person. And that, my friends, is the essence of my message. But you need to stay on to hear some more. <laughs> Who is this one person? The healing of your negative emotions comes from a continuous relationship with one person, Jesus Christ, to have communion with Jesus. You know, we don't just come to Jesus during the Holy Communion alone. We need a daily communion with Jesus. In John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we are to be fruitful, to produce good emotions, we need to remain in Him, to be in communion with Jesus. Why? What did we say earlier? The solution to your emotions is communion with one person. You're a wonderful congregation. <laughs> Colossians 2, 6, 7 reminds us, we need to be rooted and built up in Christ. Rooted and built up in Christ. And when we are rooted in Christ, we need to go for the root and not the fruit. Go for the root and not the fruit. Because many of us, we go for the fruit and not the root. For example, we want to feel peaceful. We want to have the fruit of peace. The good emotions of peace. And so we practice what? Relaxation techniques to calm your soul. Da, mm. But my friend, such techniques can only work for a while, but they can't last. If you want to have real peace in your life, don't go for the fruit of peace. By practicing all these relaxation techniques, real peace, pay attention to me now, real peace is a byproduct of your relationship with Christ. 
It's a byproduct of your relationship with Christ. It's the root which produces the fruit. So go for the root and not the fruit. To deal with negative emotions, we need this deep rootedness in Christ, this daily communion with Jesus, who is God in the flesh. But let's see. Let's see what this daily communion with God and Jesus looks like. We can learn from the psalmist who tells us daily communion with God always involves regular talking. Right? If you want to know somebody, you need to talk to somebody. And that's how relationships are built up. Here he tells you, in Psalm 42 verse 5, you need to talk to yourself. He says here, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? So we talk to ourselves. Oh, by the way, we talk to ourselves all the time. In fact, before you came, you talked to yourself. Should you come to church or not? After this, you're going to talk to yourself. What should I eat for lunch? We are always talking to ourselves. And if you're talking to yourself, the psalmist says, talk about your fears. But don't just talk alone. Talk to God. Talk before God. Because God understands how you feel and God will help you deal with your emotions. You need to acknowledge our feelings before God and never suppress your feelings. The psalmist says here very clearly, talk to your soul and then you make sure you talk before God. The next thing we can do as we are talking to God is to process our emotions with God through prayer. Philippians 4, 6-7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. Pay attention to the last three words. In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus describes the rootedness we all need. Paul tells us in this passage, don't focus on your anxiety. Shift your focus onto God by talking to Him through prayer. Tell Him about your negative feelings. And like we just did, be thankful. Have a thankful heart. Be grateful. Because why? God loves you. And God will help you. And God will give you His peace, which is beyond human understanding. And this peace will guard your hearts and minds. The word God here is a military word. It's a battle language. It's to remind us that we are conquerors. There is a battle going on and His peace will guard your hearts and minds. What are the last three words? In Christ Jesus, be rooted in Him. Because when you are rooted in Him, He is the one that will give you the strength needed to overcome your negative emotions. Now, as you're relating with God, bear this in mind, this is something we will always need throughout our Christian life, is to trust in God to work for your good. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. You know, if Adam and Eve had listened to this advice, trust in God to work for their good, all of us won't be in this mess now. If they had listened to God's truth, that He will work for their good, you know how thick your Bible will be? It will end in Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> Only one sheet of paper. Those of you who are in discipleship class, I'm sure you love this. Trust in God. Trust in God because nothing is random in God's kingdom. Everything that happens fits into a pattern for good to those who love God. And instead of trying to analyze every pattern, focus your energy on trusting God because nothing is wasted when you walk close to God. You know, even your sins and mistakes, they can be recycled into something good through God's transforming grace. You know, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 68, 
Psalm 11968, and I like these words, and I hope you will say, say this with me later. Psalm 11968 says, God is good, and what he does is good. God is good, and what he does is good. Say with me, God is good, and what he does is good. This, my friend, will hold you firm as you go on this journey of faith with the Lord. Now, we know God is invisible. So, we relate to Him, of course, in His invisible way, but God has also provided a visible link for us. And the visible link is called the body of Christ. He has left us the body of Christ. Who is the body of Christ? We just clap for each other just now. We are the body of Christ. So, we need to connect with other Christians for support and accountability. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So whatever negative emotions we feel, always connect with the body of Christ. Share your feelings with other Christians. If you've got any issues, any problems, go to a Christian counsellor, share with your pastors, your church leaders, your care group leaders, because why? They can provide you God's perspective on your problem. And when you share your problem, a problem shared is a problem halved. And my last point about daily communion is that we need to meditate on the truths and excellence of Scriptures. Philippians 4, it says, Whatever is true, honest, right, pure, Lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Think about such things. You know, who are you? You know who you are? The Bible describes you in Proverbs 23, verse 7. Proverbs 23, 7 says, You are what you think in your heart. You are what you think in your heart. So thoughts and feelings are linked Good thoughts lead to good feelings and bad thoughts lead to bad feelings. And due to our own sinful nature that's still within us, our automatic response is to think negative thoughts. So we need to counteract these negative thoughts and Paul advised us to think true and excellent thoughts. Think about what is true and excellent. How do you do that? You think about a person. You think about Jesus. Look at him in the Gospels. Saturate with scriptures and see how they describe him as someone who is the embodiment of truth and excellence. So just saturate yourself with how Jesus thinks, feels, and acts. And of course, our church does it so well. Just practice the four essentials. That will how you will maintain your own health, and walk with the, Lord, with the Lord. Now, the Bible describes that there are inner battles we fight with negative emotions. But don't be discouraged. Huh? We do not fight alone. God will help us. Philippians 1.6 says, God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. So negative emotions are healed through the supernatural work of our God. And our God will not stop. God won't stop His good work in you because look at Philippians 2.13. It says that God is at work in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. That is our God. He started a good work in you and He will make sure He finishes it. Meanwhile, He continues to work in you, to help you think, to help you act. And therefore, my friends, we need to trust in God to heal our negative emotions. But He will heal it according to His way and according to His timing. You know, many of you are carrying emotional wounds for the past, say, 10 years. If you've been covering it, keeping it for 10 years, 
don't expect the emotions to go away in 10 days or 10 weeks or 10 months because your healing has begun and it will take God's timing for it to happen. Let me share with you an example of healing. In my case, it's a fear. What was my fear? You know, when I was six years old, I was bitten by a pack of stray dogs. It was quite bad. They mauled me quite badly. And I was extremely fearful of dogs. Whenever I see a dog, my heartbeat will rise, my hands will sweat, and my hair on the hands will stand. It goosebumps. That's my automatic reaction when I see a dog. So how did God heal this negative emotion regarding my fear of dogs? Well, my friends, God took his time and God did it his way. You know, when I was 22 years old, that's 16 years after the horrible incident, I met a girl who agreed to be my girlfriend. <laughs> so when I first visited her, guess who greeted me at the gate of the compound? <laughs> you are so clever. Pastor, you've got a very clever congregation. Yes, two dogs. <laughs> barking fiercely at me. And of course, my sweet girlfriend told me, don't worry, my dogs are friendly. <laughs> so she opened the gate, I walked in, and one of them bit me. <laughs> you know, if I knew my, do if I knew my girlfriend kept dogs, uh, I might have changed my mind about her. <laughs> well, after one late night, I was allowed to stay overnight in my girlfriend's house. I slept on the couch in the living room. Don't worry, it's decent, it's decent. I know, I know what you're thinking. So I slept on the couch in the living room. But my friends, in the middle of the night, I felt a warm body snuggle next to mine. And I felt my body strangely warm. I turned to look and it was the dog that bit me. I was sleeping on his couch. And that night, I slept with the dog that bit me. Can you see how God works? Well, this girlfriend later became my wife. Of course, lah. You think I dare to tell the story like that? I was... My wife is right in front here. Due to her love for me and due to her love for dogs, I became less fearful of dogs. Isn't it wonderful? 16 years later, I met this wonderful woman. But my friends, in 2017, 53 years later, after being bitten by this pack of dogs, I had a dream. And today I'm going to show you the images in my dream. They are AI generated images. <laughs> but, 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 hang on. With God's help, they are as real as what I saw in my dream. This was what I saw. I was walking along a path, and on both sides of the path were snarling black dogs barking and threatening to bite me. But I had to walk. And I walked to the end of the path. And guess what I saw? <laughs> A gigantic, white, furry dog the size of an adult elephant. My friends, that happens in dreams. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. So I climbed on top of this white furry dog and I sat on it. And then this dog led me down the path in which I came. 
towards those black snarling dogs. So as I rode towards those dogs, every black dog prostrated down as if in worship to the white furry dog in which I was riding on. So what's the interpretation of this dream? The white furry dog represented the divine presence of God healing me from the trauma and fear of dogs. And since that dream, I became a lot less afraid of dogs. You know, the memories of that trauma still remains, but the feelings associated with it became less and less and greatly diminished. So that's how God heals. My friend, stay rooted in Him. Be in deep communion with Him. It is a supernatural work of God and you stick with God, God will heal you in His way and according to His timing. Now when you are in deep communion with Jesus Christ and deeply rooted in Him, you will begin to think like Jesus. You become an overcomer in Christ who conquers negative thinking. You know, Paul the Apostle recognizes that we battle with negative thinking. And this is Paul's advice to us with regard to negative thinking. Paul tells us not to have negative thinking, not even positive thinking, but to have Captive thinking. Not negative, not even positive, but captive. 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul uses this term. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. The word captive is again a military word. It's a battle word. It's a word of a conqueror who took control of his enemies. Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And I'm going to show you how Paul applies this captive thinking in the book of Philippians. And in this book, we'll find Paul facing many difficult circumstances. And you and I know, when you have difficult circumstances, they bring with them negative emotions. But let me ask you, can someone who is deemed to be so blessed by God be facing Difficult circumstances? You know, Paul, we all know, is more than a conqueror in Christ. And yet Paul experienced difficult circumstances. So, my friends, don't judge a conqueror by his circumstances. So how did Paul, how did Paul deal with these difficult circumstances to show us that he was a conqueror? Now, I'm going to show you how he did it. But first, let's look at his difficult circumstances. Here, you find that Paul is in prison and he can't freely evangelize. And you know Paul. Paul wants to go out there and preach the word and he's able to share the word and now he's in prison. So how did Paul take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. How did he do it? He explained it to us in Philippians 1, verse 12. He says that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. You read Philippians 1 in more detail, and you find this, that because he was in prison, many people who were hesitant about sharing the gospel went out, encouraged by the fact that since Paul cannot do it, I'm going to do it. So Paul says, I'm so encouraged. The gospel has advanced, even though I'm in prison. In fact, something very unusual happened in prison. You know, as a prisoner, Paul is chained to a Roman guard who changes every 12 hours. So can you imagine being chained to Paul and you can't run away because he's preaching the gospel to you? <laughs> you know, I wish you were chained to me, you know. But, well, that's not going to be. And here you find a man who has taken captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. 
Another example, he's facing the possibility of death, a difficult circumstances, and what was his response? Philippians 1.20 says, I will have sufficient courage so that Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ. Again, for to me to live is Christ, to be rooted in Christ, to die is gain. I'm not afraid of death. That is captive thinking. Another example, Paul is facing a difficult circumstance in which the person he cares about is severely ill. You and I have experienced that. Here in this story, Paul had a friend called Epaphroditus, and in Philippians 2, 27, is his captive thinking. He said, Indeed, he was ill, he almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not just on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. My friend, that is captive thinking. One last example. His people are quarrelling among themselves. The church, plenty of people quarrelling among yourselves. That always happens. And you find it happened also to Paul. In Philippians 4, verse 2 to 3, he says, I plead with you, dear, and plead with Sintik, to be of the same mind in the Lord. He struggles with that. Yet at the same time, Paul's focus was not on those people who are quarreling. His focus was on the peacemakers. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Who are the blessed are the peacemakers? So you find him saying, yes, I ask my true companions, help these women since they have contended at my side in the course of the gospel. That again is captive thinking. So my friends, whatever difficult circumstances faced by Paul, he's able to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ and that's what makes Paul a conqueror. Well, our sermon series is about being overcomers in Christ, to be conquerors. The Bible describes two types of conquerors. Category A, conqueror. Hebrews 11.33 says, By faith these people shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death. Their weakness was turned to strength. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But there's also category B. Hebrews 11.35 goes on to say, But others were tortured, jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips, chained in prisons, died by stoning, sawed in half, and others were killed, mistreated, hiding in caves. Let me ask you, which type of conqueror you want to be? Category A or B? A. I know, lah, sure, A one. <laughs> you know, in the eyes of God, both categories are conquerors. And we don't judge the conqueror by his circumstances. Remember this. And don't judge your own walk with God, your ability to overcome just by the circumstances you are facing. And I will continue now, and conclude rather, with the following story. In 1851, an English missionary named Alan Gardiner was shipwrecked with a number of other people on a little remote, uninhabited island off the bottom of South America. They all died, one at a time, and he was the last one to be alive before he died. He kept the journal, and they found the journal next to his body. And in his journal, he cited Psalm 34, verse 10. Here's a man dying of starvation, and this was what he said. Young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Here's a man dying of starvation, a man far from home. His body is broken, 
and all his hopes are dashed. As he looked towards the horizon, no ship was coming to rescue him. And as he looked around him, just dead bodies of his colleagues. And as he looked at his journal, what else would he write? What do you think were his last words? Here's a man. They finally found him. They found his journal next to his dead body. And this was what he wrote as his last remaining strength drained from him. This was what he said. I'm overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. His last words. Overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. What kind of dying man would think like that? It's a man who is a category B conqueror, a man who is deep communion with God, a man with captive thinking and overcomer in Christ. So to deal with negative emotions, just remember this. The solution to your emotions is communion with one person. So remain rooted and built up in Christ. Not negative thinking, not even positive thinking, but captive thinking. My friends, no matter how difficult your circumstances are, no matter how negative your emotions are, you are more than a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror not because you are strong. You are more than a conqueror because Christ is strong. And for us, all of us, we live on borrowed strength. The strength that only Christ can provide. It is our rootedness in Him that will give us the fruit of His strength. Well, God does not judge a conqueror by His circumstances. And my friends, you are more than a conqueror because you are also in communion with God. Your God is faithful. Nothing can separate you from God's love and His goodness for you. Later, when you sing the communion song which I've chosen for you, I would like you to just declare with a loud voice of faith as you sing this song about the goodness of God, I want you to sing and declare that you are an overcomer in Christ because like a category B conqueror, you can say, I'm overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. And it's my prayer that you will always know that your God is faithful. Amen.